Hi, Misha here, and this is a, another black box, and for once, I have a topic, as you can tell from the title. Now, normally I record these black boxes at night, so things are pretty even, Steven. You hear me out on the porch with the wildlife chirping away, but I'm literally just waiting around killing time right now, and so I figured I would do this in the afternoon. That said, I might have to stop it abruptly if the FedEx or UPS man shows up, or if the phone rings. So, oh well, we'll see how this goes. Also, since it's still daylight, this might be more of a gray box than a black box. I do miss sometimes the old camera with the shutter versus the GoPro that doesn't have one. <laughs> Let's talk about the pistol stabilizing arm brace situation. Should you be afraid? Should you be worried? To worry, not to worry? What's going on? What's the history? And, you know, what do I feel about it? So in no particular order, we'll just uh, dive into some thoughts I have. And I might use this video as a jumping off point to do a full Misha Co. channel video down the road as more information comes out. All right, so first off, a little bit of setting the stage. What is a stabilizing arm brace? I would imagine you know since you're here, but essentially it's a knot stock. It's considered a firearms accessory. And it was approved over 10 years ago, hitting the market around 2012, and initially not only built for, but even partially created by wounded veterans returning from serving our country in Afghanistan and Iraq, namely those who had lost an appendage, an arm, or even part of an arm, or even just full loose of a hand, use of a hand. And back then, the original arm brace was this chunk of plastic that went on the pistol tube, which would be the larger diameter tube of an AR-15 pistol. Since that time, much has changed. Uh, it wasn't long before they went from just ARs to AKs, but then, you know, newer ones like the SBA-3, SBA-4, they started going on regular mil-spec tubes, including using the adjustment positions, although keeping them with a maximum extension of not much over a foot, much over 12 inches, to keep it, you know, pistol-y. There has also been other types, not just the SIG Tacticals, for example, the shock waves, the tail hooks, you know, there's, there's, you probably know more types than even I do, but those are the ones I have experience with. All different types, things. They've been in common use for over a decade and become very popular. Why do we need these things in the first place? Well, in a word, or rather an acronym, SBR, short barrel rifle, and by extension, SBS, short barrel shotgun. In America today, if you're rifle has a barrel under 16 inches, roughly 400 millimeters, it cannot have a shoulder stock or a vertical foregrip for that matter. If your shotgun has a barrel under 18 inches, so roughly 450 millimeters, it's not allowed to have a shoulder stock. And there's of course exceptions and yeah, that gives you the thing. Why is this the case? Well, it dates back to the 1920s and 30s when World War I was over. The police in America in the 20s basically had 38 special or even 38 Smith & Wesson revolvers. Meanwhile, criminals making a lot of bootlegging money were able to afford Thompson submachine guns or BARs. And not only were these full auto, they had a propensity of cutting them down. Bonnie and Clyde being a good example of cutting down a BAR. I was also obviously sawed off shotguns long since historical classic. Um, so when they were passing the NFA in 1934, putting machine guns on a registry, what they really wanted to do was put handguns on a registry. Now this provision was eventually taken out. Obviously, you know that today. You had to be 21 to buy a handgun, but otherwise it's not much different than a rifle. But when they had it in, in the NFA, when it was still an act, 
they didn't want people converting rifles into handguns and that being legal doing an in runaround. So they essentially made SBRs and SBSs. Even when the registry for handguns was taken out, this provision remained, creating the class of short-barreled rifle and short-barreled shotgun. And it's been there ever since. By the way, originally rifles were also 18 inches, but in the 70s that was reduced to 16 inches for various reasons. And again, there are exemptions, there are things, no reason to go into that here and now. So that's the law. If you want something with a shorter barrel than 16 inches and you want to put a stock on it, in the past you had to file paperwork, uh, Form 1, Form 4, make it a NFA item, a Class 3 item. Well, the arm brace, it changed that. It gave an in-between. It wasn't intended to be as functional as a stock, but more functional than just trying to single-hand a gun, especially a heavier gun you know, three, four, five, six pounds. I think we all know. But either way, it's been a very popular item and a very safe item. By safe, I mean two things. For one, having the shooter have better control of their firearm when discharging bullets is generally a good thing. I say this being blind, um, being able to stable and hold something and have people direct me with it, even for me and people like me, as well as many, many others, it makes a lot of sense. It just makes the gun more stable and thus able to put bullets where they need to go versus flying everywhere, which, whether it or public range or wherever else, not a good thing. Gun safety, it's important. You know that. Secondly, there have been tens of millions sold and virtually none of them have appeared at crime scenes. The arm brace is not being used in crimes, no more than anything else. I mean, you could say, well, yeah, there was this one or that one. There's probably Legos that have been used in crimes. In fact, those are sharp little bastards if you don't have shoes on. Anything, if you want to say, well, there's just one instance. I mean, again, they've been out there for over a decade, but by and large, 99.999% of them perfectly legal, safe, and even useful to own. Now, the arm brace legally has had a really interesting history. <laughs> it was approved, and by that, the ATF basically looked at it originally back in 2010, 2011, and said, this isn't a gun. Our purview is not, not guns. We don't delegate accessories. They said, this is not a buttstock. Therefore, what accessory you put on a pistol doesn't really matter. Therefore, legal. Now that point was stretched more and more, especially by companies that weren't SIG tactical, but by and large, that was the reason it was allowed, was because it wasn't not allowed by the law. Of course, this has been challenged. And there's been reversals and reversals and reversals. And believe it or not, that's actually good for us. And this is not even the first time or the second, even the third time, there has been concern that these may be considered NFA items or just made outright illegal. And again, this is actually good for us. The thing is, if something is not challenged and then challenged once, goes to court, it could be declared illegal. This has happened before with things, the street sweeper shotgun comes to mind. But if an agency has an opinion, a position, reverses it, and then reverses it again, and then reverses it again, its position in the courtroom is very weakened. I mean, by that, the law, not the item. Most judges, I'm not even talking pro 2A, conservative, I mean most judges, will look at this and say the law is unclear, it's unjust, even possibly entrapment. On top of that, they'll say these people, millions of people, bought these in good faith. Many of the braces even coming with copies of the ATF letter certifying that they're legal. 
to make it illegal or put restrictions on would not be constitutional, especially applying retroactively. If you're talking going forward, but going backwards, making something retroactively illegal or restricted when it wasn't before, traditionally, historically, this country has not allowed that. A good example, the so-called G-Series FALs. In the early 60s, some originally select fire, full auto, FALs were converted in England by Parker Hale to semi-auto only. And then they were sold here in the USA. And then once the whole once a machine gun, always a machine gun thing came into the predominance in the early to mid 60s, they were declared machine guns and therefore not legal. When this finally wound its way through courts, the slightly over 1,800 that had been sold before all this were granted amnesty because they were bought in good faith. If the government changed its mind later, yeah. What's really funny about the FAL situation, it happened again in the 70s. Steyer imported some seer cut FALs and yet again they were granted amnesty because yet again they were kind of bought in good faith and they didn't have the full auto parts in them anyway. Now, not everything is as clear cut, but by and large, there you have it. Another might, good example might be open bolts. As you know today, if you have a semi-auto, if it's not an NFA item, it's supposed to fire from a closed bolt, unless it's a single shot. This is only the rule of the land since around 1981. Before that, you could have open bolt semi-autos. When they changed things, they didn't go back and retroactively make open bolt Mac 90s and what have you, excuse me, Mac, Mac 10s. Open boat Mac 90 would be interesting. They didn't make those NFA items. They're grandfathered in, and that's kind of the key. And going to the 89 import ban, the 94 assault weapons ban, no longer in effect, there was always pre-ban grandfathering in. That's the worst case scenario here, but I actually don't even think it'll get that far because again, they've flip-flopped multiple times. So, am I worried? No. But it also worries me not to worry, if that makes sense, which it probably doesn't. Let me try to explain. We need to be vigilant. In 2008, when Barack Obama won the election, people were at a heightened sense of awareness and to a lesser extent in 2012, especially after Sandy Hook. In 2016, people thought they would get ahead of the game, that Hillary might get it, and so they were buying ahead of time, kind of pre-prepping. But when nothing happened, when Trump won, they let their guard down in 2017. And this brings us to something that's often talked about, the bump stock ban. Now, the bump stock was also approved. But, whereas we have tens of millions of arm braces out there, there were hundreds of thousands of bump stocks made. And yes, I know, the FRT trigger thing recently. I'll get to that. The bump stock situation was interesting because they were found at the scene following the shooting in Las Vegas. They were used in a mass shooting. And the United States president, the head of the executive branch, which ultimately is the boss of the ATF under the Department of Treasury, essentially told them to make bump stocks illegal. And there was actually a, quite a bit of back and forth. Believe it or not, the ATF, at least some, tried to say we have no jurisdiction to do this. They even pointed out correctly so, and again, I'm not talking everyone in the ATF, just some, that they didn't have the right to make law, make legislation. They could enforce legislation passed by the Congress and signed by the president, but not to make it. Well, the president at the time, Donald J. Trump, didn't like this answer and told them to find a way. There was also expansion of powers of executive agencies including the EPA, mind you. This is how bump stocks were eventually pressured into being banned in 2018. 
after quite a bit of back and forth, more than you might realize. And so they're illegal. That's not good. Even though I think the bump stock looks like crap, isn't very useful, yada yada yada, they were purchased in good faith. Smaller numbers, more recently they were on the market far less than the braces and far less popular, but they were there. So this might seem like a bad sign for us. And it's not a good one. But it's not the end all and be all because the situation was and is different. Again, the bump stock was at a shooting. And there was a direct order from the executive. Now that's not to say our current president, Joe Biden, couldn't tell them to ban the arm brace. He hasn't. He probably isn't even aware of it, frankly. Who knows? It's not a umbrella shotgun after all, so he probably doesn't know it exists. <sighs> but since that time, the other part of our government has really come into play. Yes, there's the legislature and there's the executive. Honestly, the legislature seems to have abdicated any willingness to do much in the way of guns. They really have. We see this time and time again. That moves it to the executive and the expansion of their powers. But there's also the judiciary, the third branch. And in recent years, when firearms cases go before a judge, more often than not, especially when it's a very common sense type case, it's found in our favor even in places like California, believe it or not. And that does get us to the more or less recent ruling on the EPA and the limitations of its power vis-a-vis -vis energy. That's a good thing for us. Because it also speaks to the ATF. Mind you, a year ago, they were also talking about banning arm braces or putting in all these weird points to make an AR pistol, not a pistol, yada, yada, yada. That was quietly dropped, if you notice, very quietly. This year, when they were supposed to have a new ruling, it was supposed to be out in August. Then it was pushed back now to December. There has been no official announcement of policy. What we know or think we know is based on leaked documents, innuendo, and draft and proposals. That's not to say these things can't come true. All I'm saying is it's not true yet. And there are lots of government proposals. Many never get put into action. So that's where I'm saying we have to be vigilant. We can't just go, ah, it'll be fine and turn our heads. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose sleep over this, mainly because what good does that do? What good does worrying do, you know? To quote the Bible, who can add days, years to their lives by worrying? It's not really very productive. If you're in Congress and you're hearing this, you're, you're not, you're not. But then that's a different thing. If you're in a position to do something, do something. But the most we can do is write our congressman, make our feelings known, and then get on with our lives, doing our best in our lo local communities and being good representatives of whatever we choose to do, including firearms, 2A. So I think even if this were to go through, I don't think it would survive the courtroom. Between all the flippy floppiness, all the millions of people that have letters that came with their guns, and just the recent rulings on the EPA, I don't think it would survive the courts, not in its current form. And I think that's one reason amongst many it was not enacted last year. So what about the proposal itself? Frankly, it may be even more ridiculous than what we saw last year. You know, I watched UPS Man Never Comes. Not to get into all the minutiae, you can read about it. But the one thing I find hilarious is they want to have this system to reclassify pistols with braces into NFA. 
And one of the crazy criteria, something we don't even have for machine guns currently, they want people to take pictures. Why? Photoshop's a thing. Even if you don't have your gun with a brace on it, you can Photoshop it. And even if you do, what good is that? What level of quality of picture do they want? A really crappy one taken with an old iPhone? Or does that have to be high res, 4K? Do they want a motion video? Who's going to look at it in the government? Who's going to sit there and look at these pictures? And what is it really going to tell them? Again, Photoshop's a thing. Some might say, well, they're going to make a lot of money on the registration. $200 a gun. Except they also said there was going to be an amnesty. With zero money. You have to register it, but they're not going to charge you anything. No one knows how many arm braces are out there. Probably at least 40, maybe 50 million now. Now granted, several people probably own 10, even 20 of those. Being conservative, there are probably 10 million owners. And my phone's ringing, so apologies. Should I start the laundry? Hello. You're lucky I checked before starting these things. And of course that wasn't important. It was one of those Indian scammer calls trying to save me money on my auto insurance. I don't have auto insurance. I'm fucking blind. Anyway. So. Someone's going to have to sit there and look at pictures. Process all this paperwork. And the ATF's making zero dollars. Who's going to pay for this? It's not going to be cheap. Because the government, the ATF, is not a well-oiled machine like a business. You know, maybe a corporation could find a way to outsource it, do it cheaply, do it efficiently. This is the government. I have a feeling, even if they charge 200 bucks, they would find a way to not only use up all that money in the paperwork process through inefficiency, in bureaucratic waste, it would probably go on the whole. They would probably charge, I, I bet you anything, even though we pay 200 bucks to do a gun, based on how just antiquated, silly, and redundant their systems are, it probably cost them $250 to process an SBR. I feel pretty safe in that, knowing how the government works, because they're not a business. They're not making money on stamps. They're just, they're not. Anyway, there's no money on these stamps. Who's going to fund all this? It's, a, it's all fun and games until the bill comes due. I'd love to see that. Who's going to pay it? It's dumb. This on top of all the court issues. No wonder they keep pushing it back. Even if it were enacted in December, like any federal law, it would take four months to go into effect. So you're looking at spring of 2023. That's plenty of time. Have you ever tried to use the online e-file system too? It crashes all the time. That's with just a few thousand, maybe 10,000 people visiting a day. If this were ever to happen, we would have to have a coordinated thing where we all try to use the website at once. Because if all arm brace owners tried to file their pictures and paperwork, and fingerprints, and photo IDs, all at once. Their systems would crash so hard they'd travel halfway through the earth and end up in Beijing, China. Yeah, I know there's a joke to be made there, but you know what I'm saying. It won't work. It's not realistic, it's not practical, it's not cost effective. And at the end of the day, what the fuck's accomplished? Arm braces aren't being used in crimes. There's no hue and outcry from the, the moms against whatever or whatever in America against arm braces. This isn't a big political issue, unlike arm braces, excuse me, unlike bump stocks. They did get some infamy with the general public. Again, not saying it's right, but you know, that tends to be the stuff that gets banned is what gets attention. Arm braces just aren't that well known outside of the firearms community. <sighs> and 
In fact, when they nearly banned them a few years ago, it was because the ATF kept getting so many letters and phone calls saying, are you sure these are legal? <laughs> and after a while, the ATF said, okay, fine, they're not legal. But then they that got quickly reversed because it's just an opinion letter. And this isn't Putin's Russia. They cannot jail a million plus people for not registering something they bought legally. The first time a veteran who lost his fucking arm or hand was sent to jail for having an arm brace that he legitimately needs, even CNN, heck, even maybe MSNBC, couldn't stand by and let that one go. The optics would be terrible. Again, for what gain? The Democrats would lose the houses of Congress for sure. They stand to gain nothing. The kind of people that want gun control are going to vote Democrat regardless of what they do. But there's that middle group of people that could swing either way that this could sway. No, don't get me wrong. I'm not very happy at all with how Republicans have defended, or rather lack thereof, Second Amendment rights by and large. There's, there's been a few, but by and large, the only time they really talk about Second Amendment is around October every other year for about four or five, six weeks, and then poof. Remember the Hearing Safe Act? That was the talk of the town towards the election in 2016. By January of 2017, a little after the inauguration, gone. Never made it out of committee. Not even a bleep. I could understand if it had been defeated on the floor, you know, whatever. They quit trying because it was no longer politically useful. We have to be practical about this stuff. Who our friends and allies are and who they're not. And who just says sweet words to get us to do what they need us to do. And then doesn't give a shit after that. Again, lately, the judiciary has probably been our biggest advocate. There's been more change through court rulings than anything that's happened out of Congress or even the executive in years. <sighs> yeah, I don't think we should just be blithely unaware and think, oh, it'll be fine. On the other hand, yeah, I just can't get too worked up. Maybe it's the boy who cried wolf. We've heard arm braces are going to be made illegal or guns with them are going to be made class three so many times over the last five, six years. We, we do need to keep pushing back, riding congressmen. But... I don't see on a practical sense how this most recent proposal from the ATF will work. It's even more ludicrous than the point system from last year. I'm not sure. Hard, it's hard to say. We, we live in such weird times where things we never thought could or would happen, both positive and negative, are happening. I never thought arm braces would be a thing. If you'd asked me in 2010, I would have said, no, that's not possible. But they've come out. They've been a commercial success. Legally, they've been used properly. And they've expanded the shooting sport and made it a safer activity. It's been a win-win for everyone. Plus, the most all of them are made in the USA, so actually employing American workers and companies. Yeah. There's no damn good reason to do it. It also kind of reminds me of the import ban. You know, there was a big topic about import, pis pistols being imported not being allowed in. Now, I'm not saying that's dead in the water. I would actually see that happening long before arm braces. But that was going to happen in January, then March, then June. Now we're into September, and it hasn't happened either. These leaks, they're not fact. They're not rules yet. Now, I think sometimes the fact that they do get leaked and people get really pissed off. Think of the M855 ammo thing a few years ago. 
even cops are on board for not letting that thing go through. The fact that they are leaked, maybe intentionally so, because honestly, my opinion, not everyone at the ATF are bad people, especially the field agents in my experience. Some of them are actually even gun people. Even if they don't care about us, who wants to make more work for themselves? What benefit does it have to the average work-a-day agent, probably working way too many hours, not getting paid enough, not seeing his family enough? Why does he want more rules to enforce? <laughs> They're not going to get bonuses. <laughs> I tell you that right now. It's not in their best interest either. It's in no one's best interest, except maybe a few higher-ups at the ATF and a handful of politicians who are completely out of touch. Again, these are just off the top of my head ramblings while I'm waiting on UPS and apparently uh, Indian scam phone callers. I'm not worried as long as we're vigilant, and if it were to happen... I'm going to be honest, I would have peaceful, nonviolent, civil disobedience. This is stupid because there are plenty of grandmas and grandpas, disabled people that own these. Uh huh. I'm really tempted to turn this on for a split second, Gad. Would you get out? Hey, that was actually a, a useful phone call, one I've been waiting on, so there's that. Anyway, those are my thoughts. Not all of them, not complete, not researched, but my thoughts right here, right now, this afternoon. And based on information as of 9-8-2022, uh, it could be a totally different story even tomorrow. But let me know what you think, your opinions, your thoughts. Do you like arm braces? Do you think they're stupid? Um... Do you, do you think they should be illegal? I don't know why you would, but hey, I won't, yeah, I won't yell at you. I might judge you a bit, but I won't yell at you. No, I really like them because I like those kinds of guns, and I don't want to register and go through all the restrictions of NFA, not for everything, because you're basically married to a gun once you do that. It's an ill-conceived plan. They haven't thought it out. It's half-baked at best, maybe even quarter-baked in my opinion. But what's yours? Feel free to discuss below. All I ask as usual, please be civil. Otherwise, I welcome all opinions, points of view, thoughts, and updated information. Because again, I might try to make this into an actual Mishiko video one day. Thanks guys for tuning in. Hope everyone has a good weekend. This is Misha. Catch you very soon. Next time.